Hello, and welcome back to AOPA's Pilot Information Center live stream webinar series. Our topic for this episode is real-world instrument flying. I'm Ferdy Mack with AOPA's Pilot Information Center. Thanks so much for joining us. This webinar is brought to you by our Pilot Information Center. If you have any general aviation questions, or perhaps a specific question regarding this webinar, or for that matter, assistance with medical certification or AOPA online product support, you can contact us with your questions at 800-872-2672. That's 800-USA-AOPA, Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can also email us your questions at pilotassist at AOPA.org. Before we get started, I'd like to remind our viewers that you can subscribe to this AOPA YouTube channel by using the subscribe button. Also, during the live presentation, you can send us your questions in the chat box next to the video. We will answer those popular questions at the end of this hour-long presentation. Joining us today are Luz Beattie and Tom Haynes. Luz is AOPA's Director of Flight Operations, acting as our primary corporate pilot here at AOPA, as well as a staff flight instructor. Thanks for being here, Luz. Glad to be here, Freddie. Glad to have you. And Tom is AOPA's Senior Vice President of Media and Outreach. And of course, many of you may recognize him as an anchor on our AOPA Live This Week production. Tom also owns a really nice Bonanza with modern IFR equipment. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Ferdy. It's great, great to be here. Okay, great. All right, well, let's get started. As part of our registration process for this webinar, we sent out a survey asking registrants a few simple questions to gauge the needs of our audience. As of a short while ago, we had about 1,200 respondents. 76% of respondents said that they have an instrument rating. Most, 73% of you, have 100 hours or less of flying time in actual instrument conditions, including 12% of you with zero IMC time. And on the other end of the spectrum, 5% of you have more than 1,000 hours logged IMC. Commonly requested topics for us to cover, as well as some of the most reported challenges to IFR pilots, include weather, ATC, icing, and approaches. This information will help us guide the discussion, so thank you for participating in the survey. All right, Luz, Tom, where would you like to start? Well, I'd like to start with the tributes, actually. Um, you say some people with a thousand hours of instrument time. Mm -hmm. uh, one person uh, who had that, who we lost this week, was Richard L. Collins. Yes. And he was a uh, um, mm. you know, master uh, aviation weather guy and uh, just a mentor of mine. I had the privilege of flying with him uh, a lot of times back in the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s. And when I was a very young pilot uh, and had didn't even have an instrument rating at the time when I first started flying with Dick, and he was very generous turning the P210 over to me, ah. letting me fly it, and um, RC. coaching me with uh, how to talk to ATC, and ultimately encouraged me to go get my instrument rating, which I did right away. And uh, But anyhow, I learned a lot flying next to Richard through all kinds of weather in a complex airplane um, and you know uh, up pretty high in the, in the flight levels in that P210. So it was a great experience and I will always be grateful for him for the things that he taught me and I know that pilots everywhere have benefited from his you know thousands of magazine articles, his uh, hundreds of videos that he did for sporties and dozens of books. He's written 40 some books I think as it was. I've got several of them at home signed which I you know, really, really cherish those. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyhow, we lost Richard on Sunday and uh, so he'll be missed by a lot of people. I too had the pleasure of, of uh, making his acquaintance uh, at our flight school. Uh, he flew with some other instructors when I was instructing right. there and uh, you know, at least had the opportunity to just chat with him at the coffee pot right. a few times and uh, it was always very rewarding. And, and you know, it's it starstruck, frankly, right. to, to see in the flesh the person that's written uh, all, these, all these wonderful things and, and g helped so many pilots. Right. Yeah, wonderful guy. So it's very appropriate that we're talking about instrument flying tonight uh, in, in, in the wake of his passing. There you go. So uh, I, I thought we'd start with, uh, with pre-flight planning. But uh, as a preface to that, let's, let's go to the slide where we have a little bit more of the survey data. Uh, we asked our pilots, what do you use for pre-flight weather planning? Uh, I thought it was really interesting and, and really not surprising if you think about it. 67% of our pilots polled said that they're using an EFB, uh, electronic flight bag. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 that's where it's at. Right, it's that's cha changed the way we fly. I, right? I bought my first iPad with the sole purpose of getting out from spending all that money on, on plate books for trips that I may or may not even use the plates. 
Right. You know, uh, Four Flight brought to us, you mm -hmm. know, the idea that you can subscribe to charts and not have to deal with with trees anymore. Uh, beyond the, that, 67% reported figure for EFB users. We also have 45% of those polled using online flight service 1-800-WX-BRIEF.COM. Interesting. 45% using online flight service versus 36% using flight service, same service via phone. So again, there sea change. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the phone is is you know what the fax was 10 years ago. It's going the way of the dinosaur. So, uh, and there are some other stats there uh, on that graph as well. So, uh, so let's, let's move on from the survey data to our discussion, how to get a good weather briefing. Yeah, well, another current event kind of thing. I see the DUOTS number there toward the bottom. And uh, let's not forget there's a change occurring in a couple of weeks. May 16th is when DUOTS is going to be shut down. The FAA is, is, is shutting that contract down. And they will, in, instead, people are going to have to transition to something else. And for the most people, that's 1-800-WeatherBrief.com, which is basically the online version of flight service. You can still call on the phone if you want. Uh, but if you uh, go to 800-WXBrief.com, uh, you'll get the same weather information that you would have been provided by the telephone briefer. And they've got a series of tools on there that can be very helpful, free registration, that sort of thing. So um, just a heads up for those of you who are using DUOTS, um, that you're going to need to make a change in the next couple of weeks. It's uh, learning a new system. You know, it's not always fun, but there's some good tools there. So, uh, you know, just a transition in the way. Uh, to be honest, I haven't used DUOTS in a long time <laughs> because I like a lot of people. I've been using an EFB, um, mm -hmm. doing my flight planning on that. And then there's some great online tools. Uh, if, you're, if you do your pre-flight planning on a computer, um, you know, Aviation Weather Center uh, has got some great tools on it. Uh, you know, we can take a look at a couple of those. Yeah, let's go to the piece. You know, this, this one landing page um, is, is really nice. Uh, it gives you kind of an overview of what's going on. But you can find products like this a number of places. Uh, another one that I really like is if you go up to forecasts and look at particularly convection, turbulence, and icing, uh, some really, um, I think, useful tools. They're fairly new tools in the way that they're forecasting convection, for example. Um, here's, here's one I kind of like to use that uh, lets you step through so you can see the probability of, uh, of convection uh, across the bottom with the, with the different, uh, sort of the key to it, if you will. And then you can step through up here uh, the different hours and uh, go out a number of hours and see what, what it is that the uh, con you know, convection is, is scheduled to uh, forecast to do. And similar products available um, for turbulence and icing. We'll probably talk about icing a little bit later. And, you know, Lou's, as we were talking, some of these same products show up on uh, some of the EFBs, like yeah. Forflight, which I know you use. Yeah, I agree, uh, Tom. Um, I, th I guess I fall under the uh, higher percentage of the uh, e EFB uh, user station, right. where you actually would go in and yes. speak to one of the uh, briefers. Right. Although it was kind of nice because you had the feedback right. and, and actually, ha yeah. <laughs> it was, well, but, you know, then, you know, then there was that. weather facts. Remember that? That was you, you, you put um, some weather into the fax, or weather basics into the fax machine. Yeah, that I don't remember. As I recall. <laughs> and then you got fax back, you know, die fax <laughs> sort of uh, yeah. displays that would come spewing out of your fax machine. And for even the most basic right. flight, you know, you'd end up with a thick stack of fax yep. paper. <laughs> like this that you'd haul off to the airplane. Aren't those so the radar depiction charts that are still in the IFR written? Probably. I think they are, <laughs> yes. So, so you'll need to figure those out for your IFR Probably. written, but Don't you'll never us. see them again. <laughs> right. Um, but anyhow, so yeah, That's it has certainly, certainly changed a lot. Yeah. And you know, and, and while these are great for in the cockpit and for pre-flight planning, yeah. if you're somebody who likes to do your pre-flight planning on a big screen, you know, AOPA's flight planner is, is very nice too. It's a free tool that we've created for pilots and um, it's got uh, you know lots of nice features on it. It's got fuel planning on it. Tells you yeah. you know you put in the basic information. You plan a long flight. It'll tell you where fuel stops, approximately where to stop for fuel, and also give you color coded routings for uh, green, yellow, and red. I, I believe it is when you start to run out of fuel at the you know, right. end of a route to give you a heads up. But uh, also nice that you can a lot of overlay options. So these are some of the weather products. You know you can see now I've got winds chosen for example, so you can see the wind barbs here. Uh, you can put uh, you know, radar overlay and a lot of other weather products on top of this to really help you orient yourself to where the weather is relative to your route. Um, so another online tool that's available and again free, free of charge to OPA members. And right. it's, a, it's a great tool and our survey said about 22 percent of, uh, of those that asked that are joining us this evening right. are using our online AOPA mm -hmm. flight planner which means that by my quick math about 78 percent of you need to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really right. is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. We're only on green. And uh, well then, flightplan.com is another popular <coughs> one. I know pe particularly I people that, um, fly in turbine airplanes like you who use that yeah, one. Yeah, we do that um, uh, specifically for the uh, citation flying, I do that. Um, it's a great site. Um, the information is just so accurate when it comes to you know fuel right. as well. On the I got to say the user interface on that one is a little more challenging. I find it not as user friendly, <laughs> but you're right. Everybody who uses I, it really yeah. likes it, and they mostly tr professional pilots, and they're using it every day, like yeah. you, and mm -hmm. probably get more familiar with it. But those of us who only use it occasionally, yeah. well, I it's find like anything. Once you begin to use right. the one thing and you get used yeah. to it, that's what you stick with. Right. I, I like it for two reasons. Number one, it has that that quick brief mm -hmm. that you can do when you're you know a heck a week or right. a few weeks out when it says worst winds, best winds, likely right. winds yeah. uh, from you know if you're going a thousand miles. And then the other thing is it prints out a nice a nice one sheeter mm -hmm. that you can give to your dispatcher. You could right. even give to your your uh, your passengers mm -hmm. if they're pilots and want to read right. that stuff. Right. So it does a good job in, from in those respects. Yeah, yeah. and I, yeah. And, you know, something like with flightplan.com, again, we try to minimize in using paper. Mm -hmm. So I, I, we really just print out the flight plan itself mm -hmm. and, the, and just the, the current notams. Yep. And that's all I need, and I have enough time to, to read. Everything else is downloaded, right. and off you go. Yep. So it's yep. a great site. All right. So. Uh, Pre-flight, we've done our pre-flight uh, in the process of thinking about where we're going. We also need to think about where we, where else we might need to go. Yep. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, planning for an alternate uh, is an important part of the decision making uh, if, if, if mm -hmm. weather is a real question. You know, um, I always say that people get an instrument rating. Once you get an instrument rating, it's really licensed to stay out of the clouds because it, it, yeah. <laughs> um, it really allows you to fly near the clouds and, and make a lot of trips that you may not be able to make as a VFR pilot because there's the threat of weather or there's just some scattered clouds around, that sort of thing that might be problematic for a VFR standpoint, but it makes it for an easy IFR flight. Mm -hmm. But there are days when the weather yeah. really is down and you got to think about uh, you know an alternate. Of course, there's the one, two, three rule, mm -hmm. uh, an hour before to an hour after. Uh, 2,000 feet and three miles is uh, mm -hmm. is what your alternate needs to be forecast to be. So, um, but it's not very often that, at least in my flying, it's only been 29 years uh, <laughs> of instrument flying. Uh, not very many times actually that I've had to go to that alternate. Though I got to tell you, mm, I had my share of that. Yeah. I've had my share of that, which actually that brings up a uh, a a. Uh, a flight that I had uh, recently, just uh, bringing a 172 from uh, Lakeland to um, a little north of San Diego. So from that was Florida. From Florida to San to Diego. To California. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just, <laughs> just a little cross country. That's 40, quite uh, literal cross country. Forty isn't gallon it? <laughs> uh, 172. So okay. it was a three day uh, fun flying. We knew the second day was going to be uh, IFR. Right. And I was pretty comfortable with two hours and you know best best laid plans when it comes to getting the uh, weather. Yeah. So. The day before, weather was going to be good by 11. The TAV said it. Flight service station said it. So we uh, departed. Well, two and a half in, two and a half hours into it, we were still in solid IFR. Mm -hmm. So now, like I said, 40 gallon, uh, 172. You're starting to think about some gas. Uh, yes, very quickly. Your fingers work very quickly to get something right around you, right. and just wait for that weather to go. So yeah. it does happen, even. With all the information out there. Yeah. Well, I had I had a flight uh, once that I remember. It was a great learning lesson for me. Was uh, now this is going back quite a mm -hmm. ways. Fairly uh, new instrument pilot at the time, flying a Bonanza from Florida to back here to Frederick, Maryland, mm -hmm. and so coming up the East Coast essentially. And I'd looked at the weather that was fairly low, kind of in the middle of that route where I'd normally stop for fuel in the mm -hmm. Carolinas. And uh, but it was forecast to come up, you know. The look at mm -hmm. the, the terminal forecast, and, and then back in those days, we didn't have all these. We didn't have in cockpit right. weather or any, anything else. So you relied on, you know, the weather brief you got before you took off. You could call Flight Watch along the way to see how things are going, and. Um, well, that was pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, you could listen to AWAS <coughs> along the way, or right. ATIS along yeah. the way. You tune in, tune that in as you flew along and listen mm -hmm. to that. So, anyhow, I was flying along, and uh, the weather that was supposed to come up were near my area where I was supposed to get fuel did not come up. Mm -hmm. And for my alternate, I mean, I found an alternate that was legal at the time, but it had gone down as well. Yeah. And so now, all of a sudden, I'm I'm finding myself flying along to the point I'm going to start needing gas here pretty soon, and the weather is really yeah. low, below minimums for the most part, and 
by the time I kind of figure all this out that the weather's not coming up, I was too late to turn around because mm. it was so the weather so behind me was yeah. so bad for such such a distance. Right. I wasn't going to necessarily make it back. So I kept ply, plying along, and you know, occasionally I would start to see the weather was coming up ever so slightly. And, and some stations along the way, and finally, uh, got as far as Richmond, Virginia, uh, and managed to to fly out an approach into uh, Richmond that wasn't uh, terribly low, and and got in mm. there and got some gas, but. Um, taught me a lesson uh, yeah. to really be careful about fuel planning and alternates and, and watching the weather and, and, and re recognizing that a forecast is just a forecast. You know, exactly. it is not a guarantee by any chance, exactly. by any means. And so you really need to be prepared to take action sooner than later mm -hmm. if things aren't playing out the way the forecast says they are. Be suspicious that the rest of the forecast is going to be blown mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I always say the uh, professional forecasters. They don't have to be, right? Right. That's right. We do. That's you right. Know, kind of our lives depend on it. So. Right. I think that's a, that's a good way to look at it. Uh, it was never pitched to me that way when I was going through my instrument training. Is that the forecast isn't what will happen; it's what could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With a reasonable degree of likelihood, but there's still that uncertainty. Right. Like I say, the forecasts today are much better <coughs> than back in the days I was just describing. The terminal forecasts. So <laughs> in those days were, you know, they were what they were for the day, but the, the yeah. forecasts today really are much better, mm -hmm. but there's still no guarantee by any means. Right. Yeah. All right, so we've talked about uh, the idea that we're gonna sit down and decide we're going to fly, we're gonna do some pre-flight weather planning, uh, we're gonna think about alternates, we're gonna think about weather, but let, let's just for a moment uh, take it up one level and discuss the idea of we're gonna fly, but when do we wanna file IFR? When do we wanna design an IFR flight? And when do we want to not bother? Uh, I think there's a spectrum there as far as, you know, once the pilot is instrument yeah. rated, if and when they might elect to do so. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, I think w for starters, if, uh, if you just got your instrument rating, it's always a good idea to go ahead and file just to get more exposure to being in the system, mm -hmm. yeah, even if the weather point. is decent, to get the experience. As time goes on and you, you've been flying for you know, for a length of time or you've gotten more experience, then in, if you need to go from point A to point B, the airspace is a big deal. Uh, an example of what I'm, what I'm getting at is I fly out of New York a lot of the times and sometimes the weather is not good say, to, towards the west. Well, there's such, such a thing as a composite flight plan. Mm -hmm. So where maybe I, I'll just go VFR through the New York airspace and then pick up an IFR at a particular uh, VOR for the rest of the flight. Just kind of helps to alleviate some of the, I know, go heading way north right. of the Class B yeah. airspace, something like uh, that. Talk about how you file that flight plan. Uh, what do you actually put on the form? Okay, uh, for, for the actual VFR part, I don't, I mean, I really just go VFR. I don't right. file if the VFR. But picking, but filing it, um, you can just choose a VOR. And that becomes uh, your departure point. That becomes your departure point, mm -hmm. yep. Okay. And as you're getting close to it, you're probably getting advisories anyway. Right. So the same controller you're speaking with, ATC, say, you know, I have an IFR on file to be picked up over Trenton. Right. And, uh, and that works out pretty good. I've done yeah. it a number of times. Right. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think if, if I'm going on a long trip and mm -hmm. the weather is at all questionable, or and, and lots of times the weather is even not that questionable, just from a handling standpoint, I'll go yeah. ahead and file an IFR flight plan in good weather. And just because, it, for one thing, it makes it simple. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's the thing about instrument flying yeah. is it really <laughs> does make it simple because all the airspace goes away. ATC handles all the routing yeah. for you. Uh, sometimes nice. you may not like the routing that they hand you. Right. And you know, but if you're a good negotiator, sometimes mm -hmm. you can convince them to change your, their minds. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the airspace goes away, and it just makes it really a lot easier for particularly on a long trip. And then if weather comes up along the way, then you're already covered. You can just keep on chugging. Right. Um, but uh, other times, there are times when if, if I want to take a more, you know, kind of the choose the route that I want, if I want to fly, it's a beautiful day, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going all the way down the coast, and there's no weather, then I might just decide to n uh, fly, go VFR, or even on a long long trip like that, right. um, just because I want to pick the route and, and fly the beach, right, like that. Right. Let me uh, interject for a moment, uh, give a show note. Uh, a couple people online are asking about questions. Uh, I'm monitoring our chat on YouTube right now and keeping an eye on questions that people are posing. Uh, what we, we do with these uh, episodes is we'll have a Q&A session near the end in the last 5, 10, or 15 minutes, depending on how long we run, uh, where we will answer the most popular questions. Uh, if questions come up during the conversation, I'll in insert those as well. For instance, I've got a comment here. Uh, Andrew says, I always file IFR for every flight. If you're going somewhere, 
that might make sense for you. Right. Uh, you know, if I'm going to do pattern work or if I'm just going to go from here from Frederick to Hagerstown 20 miles away for a milk run, probably right. won't bother. But if I'm going somewhere, that's not an unreasonable way to go about right. it. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, nothing wrong with that. On the other hand, there are places that I'm going sometimes where um, it can get a little convoluted going yeah. IFR on yeah. a nice day if the weather's good. Right. Uh, for, you know, <coughs> from here to New York or here to Boston, uh, up in that area, you're going to get some crazy routings uh, if you're filed IFR because they're going to keep you away from all the airspace. Or, you know, you can climb up uh, over the New York airspace, mm -hmm. which I think tops out at 8,000. Is it 8,000 feet? Uh, it's like 7,000. 7,000. So, you know, uh, eastbound, you go at 7,500 mm -hmm. feet, motor right over the top of New York. Oh, yeah. And uh, have, a, have a nice flight, get to look down in New York and Kennedy yeah. and everything else uh, going on below you and have a much shorter route uh, as a result. Keep your eyes open, though, because we traffic all over the place. But uh, right. particularly if you're talking with, with them from a flight flying standpoint, it'll work out. I've been right over the southern tip of Manhattan, Battery Park there, VFR, yeah. both ways, many yeah. times. Yeah. Yep. All right, uh, so we're going to go. We've decided we're going to make our trip. Uh, what are some considerations, though, as far as timing, uh, whether it's number of hours, right. number of days, buffer? You know, what, what, what are some ways to think about yeah. that? That's a that's a, po a popular question that I get because I'm in my column in, in AOPA Pilot Magazine. I write quite a bit about um, using an airplane for personal travel, taking your family places for weekend trips, and it's an, it is amazing what you can do with a general aviation airplane and the places you can go. Uh, even a light general aviation airplane from here in the you know the, the DC area, we can you know less, less than a tank of gas to you know up to, like I said up to Boston, way down south to Atlanta, out to Chicago. And every place in between, you can get there pretty easily. And on a three-day weekend, uh, you can have a nice family trip. But you just need to be flexible. You know, I always say that if, you're, if you want to do a three-day weekend, plan on a four-day weekend. Right. And give yourself an extra day buffer on, on either side. So that uh, maybe if the weather, if you're scheduled to leave on Friday morning, and the weather on Friday morning is looking a little iffy, can you leave work a little bit early on Thursday and get out of there on Thursday and maybe even get partway there, get ahead of the weather? Uh, and uh, the same thing uh, on the other end. If you maybe have to leave a little bit earlier and come back half a day early, something like that. But usually there's 12 hours is kind of a magic number. Lots of times the weather will shift in within 12 hours. And so if you've got 12 hours of flexibility and certainly 24 hours of flexibility, you can make a lot of trips. And so um, I think that's just an important thing to be flexible. On the other hand, you also have to be prepared to disappoint. Uh, you may have to say to family, friends, uh, whatever, on e either with you in the airplane or at the destination we're going to meet you that, sorry, the weather today just isn't safe for my skill level, for the equip equipment I have in my airplane, um, uh, or uh, just the, you know, what's going on in the, air in the atmosphere. Just can't, can't do it in a light airplane today, and we'll have to schedule another time. Yeah. I like the way I think you put it earlier uh, when we were discussing it, the idea that you've let down more people than you can count. Yeah. yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. 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 You have to have that mindset. I mean, safety has to take priority over everything. I've had a, I remember uh, um, going, my husband had a lot of business, and we used to combine a little business and, and vacation uh, from time to time. And But I always made it a point to say, if we don't have to get there. You're, if, you, if you need to be at that meeting, just make sure you've researched with cars and how, how are you going right. to get there if we can't fly there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't want to put that pressure on yourself, right. your family. You know, the right. The other thing, you know, for us, you know, Baltimore is close by for us, yeah. and Southwest is a, it's a hub for mm -hmm. Southwest, and Southwest is really good yeah. in that you can uh, buy an airline ticket, mm -hmm. and if you buy them well in advance, they're pretty reasonably priced. Right. And if you cancel uh, before the flight, at, you know, really up to the last minute, you can, uh, depending on which level you've chosen, you either get your money back mm -hmm. or, worst case is, it goes on credit okay. and you can use it with no penalty. The mm -hmm. other airlines charge you sometimes a really hefty penalty of, right. you know, as much as a couple hundred bucks mm -hmm. to access the money that you have in your account when you cancel a flight. But Southwest, there's no charge. And so um, if you really want to make the trip but you want a backup, mm -hmm. then buy a couple airline mm -hmm. tickets. And if you don't use them, just put them back in the kitty and they're good for a year and figure you use them you know, some other time right. uh, down the road at some point. So not, that's a nice backup too. So uh, before we move mm -hmm. on, while we're still roughly in the area of uh, pre-flight planning, uh, Mark Gordon wants to know from you seasoned veterans, uh, if I may ask, how do you find cloud top heights? 
for cross-country flight planning. Mm. Where, what's your go-to to find that information? Yeah, it's typically the um. a area forecast or uh, the new graphical area 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 forecast. Will yeah, yeah. Will tell you the cloud tops. Yeah, I mean a lot of times, I and mean, he's talking about for pre-flight uh, planning. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I think that would be. I right. mean, if you're. Obviously, pilot, obviously pilot, if you're, pilot yeah. reports, but there aren't a lot of those out there. Right. Yeah. If you're in route, you can uh, ask air traffic control. If you're if you're in route, you can ask air traffic control. Uh, mm -hmm. They can ask somebody can ask above somebody you else. or below you, depending on what you're after, mm -hmm. uh, what they're experience, uh, what they're experiencing, and and maybe get a read from somebody nearby to where the tops are. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up Pyreps. Uh, I wanted mm -hmm. to make my, my one plank in my platform here, the idea that not only should you use Pyreps and, and right. appreciate them, but you should also give them. If you've never given a Pyrep, mm -hmm. you should do it. Uh, right. You don't have to give all the information that's required in the, in or asked for in, in the all that's possible in a Pyrep. And, and you don't have to give it in a particular order. And it may even be an ad hoc thing that you're providing the ATC. Uh, it, it when asked, or maybe if you think it's relevant to provide, but you could also contact flight service mm -hmm. and give them a pie rep if with any of the relevant information, such as you know what you estimate the the tops or bottoms to be, and, and temperature, and, and if you can calculate the wind vector where you are at the moment. Mm -hmm. Super useful stuff. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, so uh, let's move on to equipment in the airplane. So let's go to a graph we have here with a little more survey data. 73% of you joining us this evening reported that you have in cockpit weather. It's a pretty high number, pretty great number really when you think about it. 83% uh, of you said that you have ADSB. Uh, in uh, in the airplane uh, of those 73 percent that have in cockpit weather that is 83 percent of those have ADSB uh, weather and or traffic uh, 34 percent said they have Sirius XM uh, 28 percent said that they have uh, uh, some sort of lightning detection basically a storm scope strike finder etc and another nine percent with airborne radar so uh, we've got a lot of people with a lot of gear in those airplanes, which is mm -hmm. really great right. to hear. And, and really, you know, uh, in my mind, it, it's basically, you know, ANN Airways, VORs, DME, GPS, and then in cockpit weather, as far as the revolutionary mm -hmm. steps bringing more safety to the cockpit. Yeah, I've, I've said that uh, in cockpit weather is, is almost as impactful from a flying standpoint as, as GPS was. You know, there I, I see them as kind of rivals for, uh, it, it just increases dramatically the utility of the airplane, if uh, particularly if you're doing any kind of instrument flying because you have so much more information available to you than in the past we didn't when we were flying with maybe a storm scope in our light airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you've got, um, you know, next route available, and, and uh, you know, let's not forget that next route that we get via the satellite or off the ground stations for ADS-B is not live. It's easily 15 minutes old. Could be much older than that. Mm -hmm. And so you have to use it strategically. You cannot, you know, sort of parse your way through uh, some some serious weather using it. You need to use it to steer away from the serious weather and get a, you know get around it uh, in a course kind of way, C O A R S E kind of way. Right. <laughs> um, and so. Um, keep, but, but if you keep that, keep that in mind, it can be really useful. Plus, you've got meters and taps and uh, a bunch of other stuff that can be in a text form or sometimes now in graphic form as well. And so I, I have both in my airplane, I confess. I'm, um, I'm kind of spoiled. I've got <laughs> the uh, Sirius XM and uh, I've got ADSB weather. And Sirius XM is really nice because you, you got it from pretty much the time you start the airplane or by the time you taxi out. Uh, you're going to have the whole country from an XRAD standpoint and you can really make some good decisions on the ground. Um, ADSB and it's a little higher resolution on the next red than what you get on ADSB. Mm -hmm. uh, um, ADSB, you're going to get your your regional forecast or regional next red first, and then the national one builds. Um, but it's also free. Uh, Sirius XM, you're paying a monthly fee. So from a cost-effective standpoint, it's hard to beat free uh, on ADSB. Since you've got to make that investment anyhow, if you're going to fly in ruled airspace after 2020 right. or starting in 2020. So um, you're going to make that investment. Yeah, you might as well get something back, and that's the sure. ADSB weather and traffic. So that's a good thing that we here in the United States uh, uniquely get to benefit from because other parts of the world where general aviation has to equip with ADSB, they get nothing back. Um, so we're really fortunate that, that we do have those ground stations setting up weather and traffic for us. Yeah, yeah. Long, long are the uh, 
the days of asking ATC, what are you painting? Yeah, <laughs> how's the weather? Can you <coughs> yeah. throw me around that? <laughs> yeah, although they can still be really helpful. Oh, oh definitely, yeah. definitely can. <laughs> yeah, it is amazing how helpful the controllers yeah. actually can be. That slide that we had up a second ago, yeah. um, showing the uh, the moving map. That's an air, yeah. that's a picture that I took uh, from my airplane quite a number of years ago when I was coming up from the south, and. Um, there was weather to the uh, west of, of Washington, and normally what happens when you're coming up from the south, you're going to get routed over LDN and CSN, Linden and Casanova, somewhere over that direction to the west and come around to Martinsburg, then over to Frederick. And this particular day, as you can see, the weather was moving in, and so I was negotiating with air traffic control of uh, where can I go, and of course here because of the SFRA, which is just to the east of Dulles, yeah. um, the special flight rules area around Washington, you're not going to be able to get through that airspace. Um, so I began basically asking for what is essentially a corridor up between Dulles Airport and uh, Washington National, which is to the Brook VOR. And then I asked for Barron and Mixon intersections and then to Frederick. And I think that was a trigger with the, with the controller who knew that I was local yeah, because yeah. I knew that little trick. And uh, so he cleared me for that route because we don't always get it when you're coming up from the south. Uh, but that day was particularly helpful because the weather was there, he knew it, and he'd been working with me and trying to find a way for me to get up through there. So. Uh, the controllers are really exceptional when, when there's Definitely. weather out there. They can, can be uh, great, great help. Definitely. You Go must ahead. have a silver tongue. I think I've asked for Baron and Nixon <laughs> three times <laughs> and been denied all three. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes you you got to know the right people, I guess. Or <laughs> so the right people have to know your end number. Maybe that's what the deal is. There you go. I don't that's have a your, trick. I don't have your notoriety. <laughs> uh, so, so with all these gee whiz, whiz bang, uh, features and boxes in the airplane. One of the concerns, of course, is <coughs> uh, you may not use 90% of those features except in 10% of the times when you need them. So uh, how, how should we think about trying to maintain proficiency? What are some good ways to keep sharp on our boxes and features? Practice, practice, it, practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there's lots of ways to do it. The Garmin's got an app for its GTN products. Right. You can put that on your iPad and do almost every feature in the box uh, right. using this, this simulator, essentially. And that works pretty well. Um, and I know that, you know, Louis, I think I heard you say, or Ferdy or somebody talking, you, you plug the airplane in occasionally yeah. and, and go sit in the airplane and practice. Yeah, yeah that's, that's something that we would do at, uh, at one mm -hmm. of the flight schools where I taught, is uh, we'd plug the airplane, especially the G1000 airplanes, with even right. more buttonology to absorb. Uh, into a ground power box and you go out with the instructor or even without the instructor mm -hmm. and uh, just get that muscle memory built so you can reach and you know how to get to the mm -hmm. aux page if there's a p p feature you need or you know how to change the weather or, or whatnot so that when you're getting kicked around and you can't see outside those things aren't uh, aren't elusive. Yeah right. and then that's the time to learn all that not up there, that's true. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. The last place you want to be fumbling is you know, when you're on a, trying to reset a, a box for a, a new runway or missed yeah. approach or something like that. Yeah. And uh, that's a great point you brought up as far as the, uh, the iPad apps. We've come a long way from, you know, I mean, the, the venerable Garmin 430, 530 been around for you know, a dozen years or more right. now, and we all know them and love them. I love the 430. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, the simulator that Garmin provided uh, that you could use on a Windows PC was accurate but left a lot to be desired uh, whereas with uh, like the new Garmin GTN navigators right. uh, the, the apps on uh, on the iOS devices for example are wonderful yeah wonderful high fidelity right, yeah. right. No, I, I perish the thought I would almost say fun to play around with <laughs> in the living room yeah. if that's what if that's right. your Fine. thing but you do have to be maintain the provisions the I I had an interesting experience uh, just a few weeks ago I was in New Zealand and there's a, a really difficult approach into Queenstown, New Zealand on the South Island. And a lot of terrain around, it's an RMP approach with the, that's curved. And so I had the opportunity to fly in the jump seat of an Airbus coming out of Auckland, going to Queenstown and to see this, uh, this approach. And we'd originally been cleared for runway five, which is also a pretty complicated approach as opposed to runway two, three, which we thought we were gonna get. So we're cleared for runway five, and they set up the approach in the flight management system, which in an Airbus is a pretty big deal. And uh, they were briefing the approach on this sort of thing, and all of a sudden the wind shifted, and ATC gave them a, a runway change. So now all of a sudden they're scrambling uh, to, and meanwhile we're dodging some weather, uh, to set up the runway two, three approach. And so, you, you know, you've flown jets a lot, lose. You know what it's like with the FMS trying to scramble and, and, and reset up the, the box for a different runway. They got it done. Uh, of course, two, two crew cockpit, very capable guys. 
got it done, and we got to fly this approach. For, fortunately, by the time we got down there, the weather was perfect, and I got to see the terrain way up close <laughs> as we're uh, hu uh, hugging the, the mountains, the Remarkables yeah. uh, Mountains, they're, they're called, right next to uh, Queenstown. So, um, but it was fun, but it was a good example yeah. of what two crew operation in an airliner humming along at a pretty good speed, uh, how busy yeah. they can be just trying to keep up with the technology. Right, yeah. That is the busy time, that's for sure, especially when they throw, throw a curve, uh, yeah. curve at you at the end. Yep. And there's, there's no time to better illustrate the idea that some airplanes and some operations really do benefit and require two pilots yeah. right. than when things get busy sure. and start to go a little sideways. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, we've talked about pre-flight. We've talked about go, no go. We're going to go. We've got lots of cool equipment in our airplane. Uh, let's talk a little bit about once we're underway, departure and en route. So uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up was, uh, uh, I'm not sure, Tom, how much time you have high and fast versus low and slow. My gut says you've got lots of both and lose you as well. So you could probably both talk about this fairly proficiently, but you know, Many of our pilots uh, that are out there listening tonight may not have spent a lot of time in the flight levels, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, or conversely, we may have a lot of uh, people out there who don't fly a VFR down low anymore. I've mm -hmm. given many lessons to airline pilots who don't touch VFR because they don't have to anymore. So can you give me a little com bit of compare and contrast about what it's like on both sides of the fence as far as you know, 182, 8,000 feet, 140 knots, going you know, a four hour leg versus you know, CJ3, flight level 450, four hours, you know, covering better, the better part of 2,000 miles. You know, do things simply happen four times as fast up high? What, 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 are the, what is it like? I think, uh, I think the bottom line is it's the being organized uh -huh. and prioritizing and it developing that we had talked about this the other day. Developing that uh, muscle memory, right? Like when when you're talking about briefing and approach, it doesn't matter whether you're now 172 or the citation. The same principles yep. apply. Being you have to be ready. Yeah, being, being disciplined, disciplined and reviewing the approach well ahead of time. You got that time at cruise, yeah. regardless of whether you're going 140 knots or uh, you know 400 yeah. knots, to uh, look at the approach plate, get everything brief because once. Once you get into the terminal area, and, and in a 182, the terminal area might only be 30 miles. Mm -hmm. uh, in a citation, it's you know 130 right. miles or more. Uh, uh, when you get into that terminal area, it can get pretty busy if you're in actual, particularly if you're in actual conditions. And then if you got traffic, if it's a busy terminal area and mm -hmm. you got all the traffic, you maybe you've got an arrival procedure. So um, use that time at cruise to prep yourself right. uh, and really think through what it is that that you need to do to be successful. Uh, the great thing about flying the flight levels, we've flown together a lot in, 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 in jets, and um, is your, you don't have to worry a lot about weather at mm -hmm. during the cruise phase, right. mm -hmm. but you certainly could have it in the terminal phase. Mm -hmm. And so you gotta be thinking about that as well, and be thinking about also if you've got an arrival, the weather may be okay at your actual destination, the runway you're gonna land on, but the arrival, sometimes some of them are pretty circuitous, and they can take you into an area where the weather may not be so good. So you need to be prepared to deal with that too. Exactly, I agree. All right, uh, how about single pilot versus two pilot CRM? Do you want to talk about that? Uh, pros and cons, uh, lessons learned, any problems in those areas? Lessons learned. Well, I mean, I think uh, we have to say two heads are better than <laughs> most, <laughs> of the the, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it is the. Um, being in the, uh, on the same page yep. when it comes to no, knowing who's responsible for what, right. however you want to brief it, um, you know we we have that operation here of, of trying to be uh, as standardized as possible. We do. We try so that yeah, <laughs> so that we are uh, we know what's coming along and who's doing what. Uh, in a way, sometimes the single pilot IFR is easy because. Yeah, it's only one person it's only responsible your, your at that point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's no, up to you. you know. <laughs> there's no ambiguity as far as who right. is and who and isn't right. doing exactly, what. Exactly, right. exactly. Right. And you're just that much more focused. I, right. I shouldn't say that much more focused, but you are. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't pull the... I thought you were, That's but right. I, I thought... That's right, didn't you? <laughs> but, you know, to, to be yeah. honest, um, you know, usually two heads are better than one, but not always. I, we fly, right. I fly a lot with other pilots because yeah. we're typically going someplace on AOPA business and off to do a photo shoot and we're using my airplane for that. 
Um, and so we got two people, two pilots on the airplane most of the time. Uh, and so we have a standardized briefing, at least I do when I'm flying, that you know I, I tell the other person what I expect of them, and usually it's navigate and communicate, I'll fly the airplane, and then the next leg will, will switch. But um, there are times when things get missed if you're not clear about who's right. responsible for what. I've seen it happen yeah. where um, somebody thinks that you know, you're handling exactly. the communications, yeah, yeah, and you missed a, missed a, a frequency call, a radio call, uh, or you miss an altitude, worse yet. Uh, and so somebody forgets to enter an altitude and you bust it. Uh, so you, if everybody understands their roles and you've br if you briefed it well, right. then it should all work out. But um, certainly single pilot IFR uh, in, in, you know, in real instrument conditions, though, can be a handful. And so that's, again, where I think it's really important that you use that cruise phase of flight to get yourself ready for that approach and really brief the approach well. And look at that, study that approach procedure and the missed approach procedure. Right. Even on days when you think you're not going to need the missed approach procedure, because it's not that low. Things can happen. Yeah. You know, somebody can block the runway and you may have to go back up into the clouds because you're now on a missed approach. And if you hadn't really prepared for that because you thought you're going to have an easy landing out of, you know, a thousand feet or something like that, it, it can get kind of ugly quick. So on that note, John Spitzer asks us, how do you do an effective approach briefing if you can't get the current and root controller to commit to a specific approach? Mm. That is a good question, and I find that frustrating too. Um, I mean, for the most part, you have to have some idea of what runway, they, what, what runway they're right. going to be using, mm -hmm. um, whether that runway, um, whether they have an ILS or, or an RNAV approach. Most of the time, if you if you haven't if they haven't said which approach, you could actually just either take a look at both approaches, or even just request the one that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, they I might be advertising the ILS. Well, you might request the RNAV and. Right. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you're even questioning the the runway. If if <laughs> depending on the, if the winds are strong, it's maybe obvious which right. runway it is is they're likely to be using. Uh, but if they're parallels, you know, you may not, not be sure. Yeah. And if there's some that are a little offset from the other, you, you're never sure. A smaller airport, there's probably only one runway choice. Right. Uh, but there might be multiple approaches to that runway. It could be a GPS approach, or an RNAV approach, or an ILS, something like that. So mm -hmm. I do find that a little frustrating, too. I, I, I wish there was a way that we could learn that earlier in the flight. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe that's when we get data comm in our little airplanes, maybe that'll be <laughs> something they can, they can text to us early yeah. on. I don't know. Yeah. It always seems like a guess that gets more and more likely to be accurate the closer you get yeah. in time yeah. and space to where you're going to land. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. so Some, sometimes a controller down uh, prior to the previous, uh, to the last one, they might know. Mm -hmm. and you can, you, you yeah. could well, you you certainly could ask the controller. Absolutely. You know what approach are they advertising or are they uh, the uh, last three using? Went in on the yeah. Two, three, sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So on this uh, departure and route slide, one of the other things we uh, we mentioned was dealing with icing in flight, and that's something that's been a common requested commonly requested topic in our survey as right. well. So let's uh, let's bounce that around just for a moment. Well, that's pretty easy. Just don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get out of it. Don't <laughs> but go there. Yeah. I realize it's not always that simple. Mm -hmm. Airplanes you fly a lot. The the turbine air airplanes are equipped for flight yeah. into no, known icing, but no guarantee on that, right? Right, right. I mean, from that perspective, flying the, the citation is easier because, first of all, you are most of the time out of the weather. Um, you know, you're dealing with it either, like I said, on takeoff or landing. And, in, and even if you are encountering it, you have the equipment to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in, you know, our small pistons, yeah, you don't you don't want to be there. You want yeah. to avoid that as much as possible. Anything, and in a, in even a light piston <coughs> that's equipped with anti ice, like a TKS or something, is even if it's a you know certified system approved for flight into known icing, yeah. is only licensed to pass through icing. You know, it really is not. You don't want to hang out in that stuff because right. it, particularly if it turns into freezing rain, it can quickly overwhelm even a really powerful uh, anti ice or de icing system. So you, you want to get out of it, you, you know, and that's where this situational awareness is important, mm -hmm. understanding where the tops are. We were talking about that a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. You know, where are, the, where are the tops or the bases? Um, what are the temperatures? You know, be conscious of the temperature outside where you are, first of all, because you need to be quick to turn on or anticipate any potential icing for pitot heat, mm -hmm. uh, propeller de-ice uh, if you have it, or if you've got icing systems, get them turned on um, if anytime you're near that, that freezing temperature. but 
also being aware of what the temperatures above you and below you are and where the cloud tops are so that you can climb or descend. And climbing isn't always an option because if you're climbing, even if you think you can pass through mm -hmm. a, you know, a couple thousand feet of cloud to get on top where you think you're going to be clear, depending on the level of icing in a light piston airplane, you may not be able to get through it. You know, it may be just pick up too much, uh, much ice and you're not going to be able to climb anymore. So then you're left with no choice but to descend where hopefully there's warmer air. Uh, in an inversion, it might not be the case. And then you run into terrain questions about, you know, how much terrain clearance do you have below? So, man, icing is something that uh, you definitely want to avoid. But the good thing is, you know, we've got some better tools. Uh, back back to that Aviation Weather Center uh, website, um, one of the one of the new newer forecasting tools on there is related to icing. And um, you've got a lot of information here that, again, not very many years ago, you did not have access to this forecast icing, you know, this level of detail, for example, that you've, that you've got here. Um, you know, can look at, I like to look at the probability uh, one. And then choose your altitude, which, um, you know, for a lighter plane, let's say it's 9,000 feet right now. Uh, obviously, there aren't very many places in the entire uh, continental United States where there's going to be much of a problem, but you can see the scale at the bottom gives you a sense of the probability of icing it, you know, out, out here in the mountain states. And at the top here, you can step through time, and so it's an actual forecast of where they predict icing is going to be. So uh, it's very graphical, it's, it's easy to use, and quite helpful uh, when you're trying to figure out where icing might be and whether it's going to be a factor on a particular flight. All right, so uh, that's getting us there. Uh, once we're there and we need to start thinking about our approach and potential missed approach, Tom, you wanted to bring up in particular planning for our missed approach process and the go-around dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, that's one where um, I, I really like to, once I brief <coughs> the approach and have everything all set up, um, and again, as far out as practical, as soon as you know the runway and you can get the and the, and the approach that's going to be used, get all that set up, and then really think about the missed approach procedure because that's a really dynamic point from an aerodynamic standpoint with what's going on in the airplane. You know, you you're, you're pitching up and you're adding torque and p factor and all this stuff that really, if you're going back into the clouds, can be a really dangerous point in the flight. So I like to think it all through, and I actually um, will. Basically, it's kind of a little dance I do in the, in the cockpit where I will actually physically, you know, without actually moving the throttle, but I'm actually touching the throttle and thinking about what happens when I get to that missed approach point and I don't see the runway. And I always assume I'm not going to see the runway. And even, even when I'm on the approach, I say to myself, you don't have to land. Mm -hmm. You know, reminding myself that if it's okay to go around and I'm sort of right. mentally cocked myself to be ready to go for a missed approach. And so, but I'm, but I'm practicing it essentially as I'm, as I'm nearing the airport and thinking about what I'm going to do, you know, pitch up, power up, flaps to uh, uh, approach setting if I've got them, and usually on, a, on an approach I'm not even going anywhere past approach until I've got the runway in sight anyhow, but mm -hmm. it could be flaps up. Uh, you know, well, gear up and then flaps up typically depending on the airplane. And, you know, climbing away. And what's going to happen? What's going to be the what's going to happen to the airplane? Well, you know, you got to add rudder, and uh, I'm going to keep an eye on that attitude because I don't I don't right. want that attitude to get away from me, and I don't want the pitch to get away from me because I'm really close to the ground and I'm slow. So there's a lot going on. So the more you can think that through that and anticipate the forces that are going to be acting on the airplane, the better off you're going to be. The better prepared you're going to be to deal with what's happening. Yeah. All right. So uh, we also in this slide mentioned deviations and holding in particular. Oh, yeah. uh, we kicked around the notion for starters of how often do you really have to hold after all that training on published holds and arbitrary holds in your instrument training, how often do you really have to hold? Mm. And, and what's the secret to maybe not having to hold? <laughs> well, I can tell you in the 25 years of uh, flight instructing, I'm very good at holding, but in the over 25 years of flying, maybe I was given one or two, yeah. and I probably started the hold, and then they vectored me out of it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, same with me. Slow I mean, it up, I guess. 20 and 29 <laughs> years of uh, <laughs> instrument flying for me, and boy, I can count on easily on one hand yeah. the number of times that I've actually entered a hold and the number of times that I've gone on more than two turns. Boy, that's maybe twice. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but again. 
There are tricks, you know, you can slow down as soon as they say, you know, uh, yeah. you get any sense by hearing, listening hold. to the radio or expect a hold, it's like, whoops, I'm dialing, yeah. I'm dialing that throttle back yeah. and uh, slowing down and hope, hoping that they get everything sorted out by the time yeah. I get there. I think that's, that's, that's uh, rare. Right. But you've got still got to learn it, and sure. that's, that's like why we practice these things, right? Because mm -hmm. sometimes they, they do actually happen. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> I wasn't nearly as, as brilliant as you two coming up with the idea of slowing down on my own when presented with this the first time, but coming IFR back from uh, uh, Winchester to Frederick uh, on a marginal day, there was uh, an airplane ahead of me who had the airspace locked up here at Frederick before we had a tower mm. uh, trying to get in. So uh, Potomac let me know that I was wasn't going to be able to get into the, uh, the terminal area until that airplane was either up or down. Uh, and they made the suggestion, Potomac, the controller said, uh, you know, suggest minimum forward airspeed. So Thanks they, they, they <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. They said, no problem. That'd be great. Yeah. It's better than flying in circles. At least right. we're headed home. <laughs> so that worked out well. Right. <coughs> All right. Um, finally, I do want to uh, to mention to everyone, our, our viewers out there, uh, if if this chat has piqued your curiosity uh, about instrument flying, or if it's uh, maybe rejuvenated your desire to do so, uh, you should go to our website. Uh, AOPA.org, and in particular, uh, our Air Safety Institute resources online. We've got a wealth of educational and training materials on our website with uh, courses, on full, full fledged online courses, short form quizzes, uh, safety publications, uh, lots of articles, uh, helpful videos, even podcasts that, uh, that will really, uh, really satisfy your craving if you're, if you're wanting more on this subject. Uh, so I, I appreciate all of our, our viewers uh, coming in with their questions this evening. Luz, Tom, do you have anything else you'd, uh, you'd like to chime in with? I think it just to build off of what you're just talking about with the ASI courses, uh -huh. I mean, you know, keeping your head in the game, even, in, even if you go for lo long periods of time without flying, keeping your head in the game uh, by looking at online videos, taking online courses, you know, if you, know, if, if you bought a course from one of the, the big uh, companies that, that sell flight training products, uh, reviewing those kinds of things, um, and just talking with other pilots. You know, there's mm -hmm. just so much to be learned from from what others have experienced. Uh, listening to podcasts, that kind of thing, can really be helpful in keeping you kind of mentally prepared and, and like I said, keeping your head in game and, and developing that good safety culture. Mm -hmm. um, and and then of course going out and flying a lot too and practicing approaches, practicing holding, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about the missed approach. You know, doing you know actually doing missed approaches. Uh, all that kind of stuff is is all important for for safety and just for the comfort. You know, you've, I I fly so much more confidently when I have uh, been out training and, and and just feel like I've got better command of the airplane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a very expensive flight. I, I I'm probably one of the ones that have the most 150 IFR. <laughs> uh, you know, for 10 years I've operated my own business right. and. I, I, I did. I think I had a, uh, a, a 150 with WAS. Uh -huh. First 450, that, the 430 that came out with WAS. Yep. I had. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to spend a lot of money just to try to stay current as well. But yeah, I mean, there's such a thing as hangar flying as well. Mm -hmm. You can gain from a lot of the pilots. You know, we're all in the same boat. And uh, when I was an instrument student, I. Uh, I really got a lot out of the long IFR cross country. That was part yeah. of the requirement. And I, I think True. back to that flight often. And as an instructor, I like to promote the idea with uh, with rusty IFR pilots. Mm -hmm. Let's go do that same sort of thing. It's it's one thing to leave out of your home airport and, and fly the same three approaches back yeah. into the same runway all the time, or even go one or two towns over. It's a different thing to say, okay, you know, we're, we're actually gonna experience all phases of flight in a normal, amount of time, including, you know, maybe you've got a hundred mile leg. Uh, yeah, it's a little more expensive than just right. getting six and six at home to keep your currency. Right. But mm -hmm. there's there's something to be said for, you know, the, uh, you know, what's what's one of those expressions about, you know, long periods of boredom punctuated by short <laughs> bursts of sheer terror, yeah. right? It's good to have that that, yeah. that boring stretch in the middle. You know, practice right. just working with, I, with mm -hmm. HEC en route as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the way the professionals do it. It's called loft line the oriented loft. flight training. Yeah. And, w and the, the, the jet type ratings that I've done, that's an important part of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a regular exercise as mm -hmm. part of the training is, is, is going a, doing a loft, which is basically mm -hmm. a real trip. Right. It's in the simulator. But, uh, you, you know, you, you, do, you plan a flight, you take off, 
you do the cruise portion. Sometimes they'll speed that up a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then you do the you know arrival, the depart, the descent, arrival, uh, landing, go around, mm -hmm. you know, missed approach kind of thing, the back up, hold, do that sort of thing. And and it's it is a really good way to just stay in the game and, and stay exercised. Yeah. Great. Yeah, the, uh, the first time in, after a long time when I received an instruction on a descent, uh, which was you know across. You know, 50 miles west of XYZV or at or below flight level 230, my brain just went <laughs> I remember <laughs> hearing this once, uh, but I, I could I literally like couldn't even get it written down. And, and Luz was already, <laughs> you know, she already had it in the FMS, thankfully. Uh, so yeah, yeah, just working those muscles, working yeah. that, that mental muscle memory. That's what it all comes down to. Exactly. All right, well Luz, Tom, this has been wonderful. Thanks so much for uh, taking this time to enlighten our members on uh, your take on real world instrument flying. Okay, thanks for having us. All yeah, right. thanks for having us. And to our viewers, thanks so much for joining us as well. If you have any questions as part of your membership, you can contact our Pilot Information Center staff Monday through Friday at 800 USA AOPA. That's 800 872 2672. Or you can email us your questions at pilotassist at aopa.org. Also, while you're here, please do subscribe to this YouTube channel using the subscribe button just below the video. And don't forget to check out the AOPA website for resources that we've discussed tonight and more at www.aopa.org. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.